The name Persia, which had identified the ancient Aryan people for many centuries, was changed during the years between the two world wars. In 1935, Persia officially became the Islamic Republic of Iran. In November of 1979, Iran's new leader, the Ayatollah Khomeini, urged his people to demonstrate against the interests of the United States and Israel. He denounced the American government as the great Satan and the enemies of Islam. The Iran hostage crisis was the result. From November 4th of 1979 until January 20th of 1981, a period of 444 days, student proxies of the new Iranian regime held 52 diplomats and other American citizens hostage. The crisis was a direct cause for the loss of Jimmy Carter's re-election for a second term as President of the United States. The hostages were released 20 minutes after Reagan's inaugural address that confirmed his presidency. The hostage crisis punctuated the first Islamic revolution in modern times. In April of 1981, the Algiers Treaty was signed in which the United States agreed to not interfere politically or militarily in Iran's affairs, nor to allow the hostages to take any legal action against the Iranian government. When the United States and its allies encouraged the Shah of Iran to start up a nuclear energy program in the 1970s, they did not realize the present consequences of their actions. Iran's nuclear program began to accelerate in the late 1990s to coincide with a developing independent press and just before a reformist parliament was elected in 2000. The reformists supported the program but intended to comply with Iran's international obligations. The United States, however, did not support the reformists and labeled Iran as a member of the axis of evil along with Iraq and North Korea. By 2003, it became clear that the reform movement had stalled and that the international community began to take notice of Iran and its nuclear program. During these past three decades, other nations, including some of Iran's neighbors, Israel, India, and Pakistan, also engaged in nuclear programs. The situation has become increasingly dangerous and there is growing hostility between Iran and the United States. Recently, representatives from the United States, Britain, Germany, France, China, and Russia met to discuss the threat of Iran's program to develop nuclear weapons. All of these nations, except China and Russia, requested immediate action from the United Nations Security Council and the International Atomic Energy Agency to force Iran to end its program. With the recent election of Iran's new president, Mohammad Ahmadinejad, the 80 to reform government that preceded him came to an end and he aroused international anger in a series of blunt statements that were directed against his neighbor Israel. In one of his reckless speeches, he said that Israel should be wiped off the map, or perhaps that it should be transferred from their present location in the Middle East to a new location in either Europe or North America. He suggested that some European countries, or the United States, Canada, or Alaska, could give a portion of their land for a Jewish state. Furthermore, he said that the Holocaust during World War II was a myth, that served as Europe's pretext for the very existence of the state of Israel. His extremist and inflammatory comments reflect his intention to become the leader of the anti-Israeli campaign in the Middle East. It also underscores the reason it is so important that the international community work together to prevent Iran from any further development with their nuclear weapons program. Israel's foreign ministry spokesman reacted to his statements by accusing him of acting outside international law. United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan and many world leaders condemned his remarks. Iran has insisted that its nuclear research complies with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, of which they were a signatory, and that its program is designed solely as a means to produce electricity. The EU three nations, Britain, France, and Germany, however, have joined the United States in calling for Tehran to be referred to the United Nations Security Council because of its outright defiance. The two other nations, Russia and China, have historically opposed the other members of the Council because of their close connections with Iran. Russian and Chinese officials have endeavored to persuade Iran to give up their nuclear ambitions, and recently, however, Russian officials became angry that Iran had broken a voluntary moratorium and had announced their intention to resume uranium enrichment efforts, which they believe could produce enough material to build a nuclear bomb in a few years' time. 
Russia was unable to persuade Iran to accept a compromise proposal that would justify the United States and the EU-3 in which a joint Russian-Iranian project would enrich uranium in Russia. Iranian officials threatened to end all voluntary cooperation with the United Nations, including their allowing spot checks of atomic sites if it was referred to the Security Council. There has been much talk in recent months about Iran's underground nuclear facilities and the United States' intentions to destroy them with deep earth-penetrating weapons. Chris Ford, in an article, Times Arrow, The Coming Nuclear Epiphany in Persia, Washington Post of April 20th, 2006, refers to Seymour Hersh's report in The New Yorker of April 8th, 2006. The report concerns United States plans for a possible preemptive strike against Iranian nuclear facilities, and Ford says, this strike includes a very viable nuclear option which was approved months ago and is now in operation. The planes are ready on continuous alert, making nuclear delivery practice runs along the Iranian border, waiting only for the signal from President Bush to drop their payloads of conventional and nuclear weapons on some 400 targets. And when this attack comes, either as a standalone knockout blow or else as the precursor to a full-scale regime-changing invasion like Iraq, there will be no warning, no declaration of war, no hearings, no public debate. The already issued orders governing the operation put the decision solely in the hands of the president. No one can predict the final outcome of world events as they are unfolding during the closing years of this age and the completion of the church. The present crisis in Iran, however, brings our attention to a very dangerous situation at the present time. The Apostle Paul in his second epistle to Timothy spoke of perilous times that would come about during the final days of this present gospel age. He wrote, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, 2 Timothy 3.1. We are witnesses of the increasing violence that is taking place throughout the world as evidence of the closing scenes of this age. The prophet Joel was moved by God's Spirit to provide a glimpse of this present time. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare, or sanctify, marginal translations, war, wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong, Joel 3, 9 and 10. The prophet points to the spirit and willingness in which men are ready to die as martyrs for a misguided cause and the degree in which suicide bombers sanctify war and violence. Let the weak say, I am strong. This attitude and the defiance with which it is stated describes the present crisis and the near inevitable collapse of all worldly institutions. We watch the events of our time with increased interests and realization that Christ's kingdom will soon assume control of the human family's destiny. Cyrus, king of Persia, who conquered Babylon and set free from bondage the typical people of Israel, represents our Lord as the king of kings and lord of lords, Revelation 19:16. Babylon felt secure behind its massive impregnable walls, enormous gates, and ample provisions stored against any threat or siege. Cyrus and his army from the east diverted the waters of the Euphrates River and overthrew the mighty capital of Babylon. The city was not only overthrown, but also the entire empire, together with all of its great power, influence, and idols of silver and gold. Mystic Babylon is also described by the revelator. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, Revelation 17.5. The apostate church system, including its many divisions, is also destined to fall together with all of its riches, influence, and false teachings. Of her it is also said, The water, Euphrates, thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Revelation 16.12 All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Revelation 18.3 she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Verse 7. 
The greater Cyrus will bring an end to all of Earth's corruption and deception represented in Babylon and will set free the entire family of man who have been held bondage under the divine sentence of sin and death.